Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, you know, good morning, good evening, good uh, night, uh, depending on where you are from. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, James uh, Grinning. Uh, for those of you uh, who are probably already familiar and which is why you're here, uh, James was one of the original Agile Manifesto signatory. He's been a very strong uh, proponent. I like uh, the way I relate to James is two things. One is the uh, all the awesome work he's been doing in uh, pushing the envelope on TDD and embedded systems. I think that's really his core forte, in my opinion. Like the the the, the reason I would really know. Uh, and the second reason that is not very well known, but uh, certainly worthwhile mentioning, is uh, he was the original inventor or creator of uh, planning poker. Uh, which a lot of people have uh, used, uh, abused, <laughs> uh, what not. Uh, and uh, I think James has uh, moved on. He's, he's found uh, other techniques which are uh, equally inaccurate, uh, as he says. <laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, but faster, yeah. So great. I think without uh, further delay, I want to hand it over to James. Uh, if you, James, if you don't mind sharing your screen. Okay. I'll share that in one second. I do happen to have a replica of the original planning poker card deck right here, which of course, as an extreme programming uh, enthusiast, we always have note cards handy. Awesome. Yeah. I, I could send a, uh, Stacks of these, uh, the replica decks to everybody around the world. Um, at any rate, let's start the presentation. Hello, everybody. It is uh, an honor to be here with you. And uh, I've got a topic I'd like to talk about. It's a topic for, oh, thank you for the thumbs up. I appreciate that. I'm going to uh, hopefully see some of those during my talk. Very good. All right. That's good. Uh, is it, can you do the other symbol too? Can you do thumbs down or? Um, Good. I'm glad that's not possible. All right. Oh, there's a, you can wave as well. Okay. Very good. Um, so uh, technical excellence, this talk is for uh, if you're a developer and you don't know why you should care about the technical practices of extreme programming, this talk could help you. If you're a business person and you're wondering if you're getting tired of your team telling them, telling you, you can't release the product because you've still got some bugs. Um, maybe you're interested in this. If you're finding it's hard to get things done it, at the time when we want to release, maybe you'll be interested in this too. So technical excellence, you need it as the title of my talk. Um, <clears throat> and I'll see if I can work all this technology here. And sure enough, I can. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about me because you can tell by looking at me, I've been doing this for a while. But when I went to high school, one of the guys I worked one of the one of my friends growing up was programming in high school and he was trying to get me excited about it. He showed me his punch cards. He showed me the tele the punch machine. He showed me the room with the no windows and a raised floor. And I thought, <laughs> stay away from that. This is not going to be anything I'm going to like. And um, then in university, I'm studying calculus as part of engineering and we had to solve uh, the problem of calculating the area under a curve. And if you've studied physics, I'm sorry, if you've studied uh, uh, calculus, you know what Newton did to discover calculus was he kept making these rectangles smaller and smaller. And so we had to simulate that in a computer. And I found out it was fun in that someone would actually pay me to do this thing. And that was kind of a shock to me because it's like, hmm, it's solving a puzzle. I could do that and someone could pay me. Okay, I think I'll do this thing. Uh, my first job had to do with embedded systems. We had kind of primitive tools in the day. And I'm telling you this not to, because I think you care about my history. I'm telling you this, there'll be a point. I'll bring it all back together later. But, uh, you know, booting up this computer meant keying in the right binary sequence. And, you know, I didn't actually ever do that successfully. I make too many mistakes for that. But the guy I worked with could do it pretty reliably. So uh, he was the guy that would boot up the computer. Um, pretty primitive tools. And of course, things went wrong. And if you had to erase your program, you see the little windows there in those, uh, in that, uh, in these chips, you shine ultraviolet light in those to erase the program so you can reprogram the device. This is kind of a long feedback cycle. 
um, something that we don't really want to have as a long feedback cycle. Uh, and we had tools and things, primitive things, logic analyzers and oscilloscopes to find out what our code is doing. We would have loved to have had a serial port. I think after a couple of years, we did get a serial port just for debugging. And uh, but it was a it was a rarity to have the hardware to be able to actually just dedicate it to something like debugging. I mean, why are you going to write bugs? Um, we didn't know any other way. Source level debugging was assembler. Um, so there's a little bit about what the technology was like when I got started in 1979. You'll see that number come back, and you'll know why I mentioned this later. <clears throat> now, uh, about 20 years into my career, uh, I was working with Bob Martin, who I've known for most of my career, uh, and we were interested in learning extreme programming, and we made an arrangement with Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries, Martin Fowler, and Ward Cunningham to come and teach us, and we could teach people together, and that's how I bumped into extreme programming. It kind of changed my life because uh, what I thought before then was the way you write code is you write some bugs and then you go fix them later. Um, that was the way to do it. But extreme programming showed a different way of doing it, which was very, well, would it really work was one of the things I was wondering about. And I think it would really help with embedded systems. But uh, that's a different talk. So here's Bob in uh, 2001, almost... Uh, almost 20 years ago now. And he says, James, would you like to go to the Lightweight Methods Summit in Snowbird, Utah? And uh, I don't know if you know about Snowbird, Utah. It's half a world away from you. Uh, but Snowbird, Utah is where one of the best ski resorts in the world is, certainly with the best snow in the world. Uh, and of course, what I thought was, <laughs> sure, Bob, I think I could make it. Um, I'm learning from these guys that we we're going to go to this meeting from. Lightweight methods, what's that you're saying? I thought you were part of the Edgel Manifesto. And uh, yeah, but the name before the Edgel Manifesto meeting was uh, what we were fighting at the time were heavyweight methods. Uh, and what we were trying to do was something lighter. And so we called it lightweight methods. And then right away in the meeting, I'm pretty sure it was Ward that said it, was <laughs> we need a better name because who wants to be known as a lightweight? And uh, so somehow Edgel came out of that. But one of the things that was of the time is this book by Humphreys. And maybe we misunderstood it, uh, managing the software development process. But what it was leading to was doing the interesting work, the design work, you know, in the United States, and then emailing that. Uh, was there email? Uh, somehow getting that the requirements to places where lower cost programmers might live. I'm glad to see you guys are thriving, a thriving programming community in India. Uh, and then, you know, that skill that didn't matter, you know, we could send across the world. <laughs> As it turned out, that skill really matters. Plug replaceable programming units. Watts was talking about if you had a better process, the people wouldn't matter. Now, I'm not sure if that's exactly what Watts meant. I'm not sure if he actually meant that, but that was the message the industry got. If the process was better, the people wouldn't matter. And now we get to the Edge of Manifesto meeting. And, uh, well, let's see what was happening at the time. Defects, delays, frustration, late projects, death marches, you know, a lot of the same stuff we have today, um, <clears throat> just different. Uh, here's this uh, Edge of Manifesto thing, which we thought pretty much no one would care about it. Um, after the meeting, and uh, some of you guys care about it. So people care about it now. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we didn't think it would really change anything. We had no intent, no uh, uh, idea of that. But the, the first bullet point is kind of interesting because I thought extreme programming was an improved way, an improved way of working, an improved process, improved techniques. Right? That's what I was thinking. And everybody in the room is talking about individuals and interactions. And this is kind of strange to me that they were putting the, the people on the front side of this. Because I was thinking, if people did extreme programming, <laughs> things would be a lot better. But they're talking about, you know, no, people don't, you know, you put good people together and they'll do good things. And this is like, oh, but I'm an engineer. It's like, no, let's solve problems for this people stuff. Um, you know, that makes us engineers kind of uncomfortable. Uh, 
So that's a little bit about the my roots here. Oh, also there was a first scrum class ever was held at our office at, at Bob Martin's office in the Chicago suburbs in 2003. And here's some of the people that attended that course. Now, this is kind of interesting. Uh, the Scrum uh, kind of has taken off, right? There's all these people who are called Scrum Masters now, unless they're changing their name to a more politically correct name these days. I don't know, but I don't care about, <laughs> I mean, this is, they're the master of the Scrum, okay? So 300,000 of them, okay? And uh, so what's Scrum supposed to do, Ken? It's been become amazingly popular. I bet some of you are Scrum Masters there. Let me see some thumbs if there's any Scrum Masters there. Thumbs up. All right, there are some. And then there's people that are participating in Scrum teams, right? So what's Scrum supposed to be? Let's see what Ken says it's supposed to be. Scrum exposes every inadequacy and dysfunction within an organization's product and systems development practices. The intention of Scrum is to make them transparent, your problems, so you can fix them. Oh, it's problem solving. All right. Now, in the 80s, we were doing this thing, TQM, Total Quality Management. Every 10 years, by the way, TQM gets rebranded into a different thing. Now I think it's called Lean Six Sigma, and I'm not sure what it'll be called next. But uh, the names keep changing, but the, the basic core is the same, structured problem solving. Now, Scrum is like structured problem solving in its definition, although... Uh, kind of what I see most of the world doing is not a problem solving loop, but a doing loop. Let's do Scrum. And they keep doing Scrum, whether it makes any sense or not, or they're playing planning poker, whether it's solving their problem or not. So I'm seeing too much of the do cycle. I didn't see any thumbs go up there. So you people are wondering now. Um, so we're, we still have problems, but nobody's saying, nobody's seeing, it's, you know, where's the visibility? What are we trying to find here? I'm finding that there's a lot of, in Agile, there's a lot of people following the dogma and less people solving the problems. And I'd like to change that. I'd like to see us having more problem solvers and less dogma followers. If we're going to do something, why are we doing it? What problem are we trying to solve? Right? If we put the problem in front of people, then we have a chance of solving it. I picked up this book a number of years ago in preparation of this talk. I, you know, I kind of been interested in aviation. My father was a World War II fighter pilot, and that's uh, he was a wingman in an important uh, battle during World War II, and that was uh, the source of the name of my company. And I know the military does a lot in debriefing, so I picked up this book to find out about debriefing. And the person who's writing the book is a fighter pilot, and he went from copy machine salesman to fighter pilot in two years with no aviation experience because he could take feedback and make changes and improve. Okay, so here is a pilot coming in to fill up their aircraft. And the way that this is designed, you can see that umbilical there is gonna be flopping around in the wind and the plane's gotta fly in and plug into it. This is very stressful uh, if you're in a battle situation, as I understand it from reading the book, I don't know, have no firsthand knowledge here, very stressful situation to be in. And so they wanted to problem solve this. And they came up with a solution, which was have the fighter pilot come and fly in formation with the tanker and let the, the pilot take a break because this is a more relaxing thing to do than trying to fly into a pinpoint in the sky, right? They can fly in formation and leave the boom operator up to filling the aircraft back up with fuel so you can get back to business with the enemy. All right, so this is interesting problem solving, real problem solving. They actually found a problem and solved it. So, Ken, how are people doing at solving their problems? Uh, how do we think we're doing at solving our problems? I read a uh, an article in, uh, what was this in? Uh, David Dunning in Smart Planet. Uh, he surveyed engineers to see where they thought their skills were. And it says here, I'll just pick through some of the numbers, 32% of the engineers uh, wait, let's see. Uh, in company A, 32% of the engineers thought they were in the top 5% of skill. And <laughs> company B, you know, 
you think it's lonely at the top, go to company B, 42% think that they're in the top 5%. Hmm, what does this mean? Interesting. Well, it means that a bunch of people are wrong. 40% uh, think they're in the top five. That means 87.5% of them are wrong. I know my math doesn't quite work out, but uh, it's more about, are we thinking about this right? Why do we, what is the skill acquisition model? Maybe you're familiar with this Dreyfus skill acquisition model. There's a progression of skill growing that we can go through from novice to advanced beginner, to competent, to proficient, to expert. And, you know, we could march along there. And, um, you know, so in that study, uh, a lot of people thought they were up there at that expert area, but where were they really? Um, If you have an aptitude for something, and this a friend of mine wrote this uh, article. Actually, it's only an e-friend, only an e-friend. We've never met in person, but uh, we've met to, but have not gotten around to it yet. Uh, he wrote this article, and it, it really spoke to me. But he said he was trying to learn American bowling, and he had an aptitude for American bowling and got pretty good really fast, but he plateaued. He couldn't get any better. And then when he started to get some help, he found out he had some of the fundamentals wrong. He wrote this article about this happening to developers, and he calls it the expert beginner. So imagine that you're working, and the way most of us developers work is by ourselves, so we don't have any feedback. And if we were to produce something that was useful and that made money for our company, your company is going to praise you, and you will have accomplished something important, but you might have done it in a way that isn't as good as it could be. One of the things I like to think of in, well, this so if you were able to advance and produce this application, you would get the, and you're only ever seeing your own work, you would get this idea that you're an expert. Now, for me, I kind of think of this now after looking at a lot of code, getting something to work is not easy. All right. So I think, though, it's the aptitude test for programming. If you can get the app to work. Right? That's the aptitude test for programming. Then you might be able to grow the skills to really be a professional programmer. And there's a lot to know. But if you can't get an app to work, you probably don't have the aptitude. So how are we doing? Okay, I'm going to continue on this thread of how we're doing as an industry. Um, and there was an invitation again 10 years ago about uh, to go to the Agile Manifesto 10-year reunion. And a number of people went there, and there was an agenda. Oh, it guess where it was, Snowbird, and that means they're skiing. So, of course, I had to go. And um, it was an interesting group of people that were invited. Some of the original people from the Agile Manifesto were there, and some others that are involved in the community are there. And it was a great meeting. We wanted to explore and come up with, guess what, four bullet points um, on what's wrong with Agile. What, can we, what do we need to do with Agile? And... We, uh, what do we, how do we have to fix Agile? Because we kind of thought it was broken. And I think it still is somewhat broken. Although, of course, there's places where really good things are happening. There's a lot of places where not the right things are happening. So here's this group. It was a structured media, unlike the first one. Um, and we did come up with four bullet points, of which I remember two of them. Uh, because they're the two that I actually cared about. And the other ones, you know, were also RANs. Demand technical excellence. If we want to get good in our industry, we've really got to take the quality of our products and the way we work. We got to keep improving that. And how are we going to do that? By helping people change, helping promote change. That means we have to find ways ourselves to change and help people change how they work. Uh, my business is about helping people learn test driven development. Um, and it's been quite an interesting journey to find out ways to help people learn that. And I can't convince you about test driven development about it being a good idea or not, I can give you an experience of where you might convince yourself. This is kind of how, what I've discovered in, in my applying of these two things here. But how are we doing? Excuse me, I'm a little thirsty here. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's late as well. Um, so Ken said, right, we're going to fix problems, but what's happening, Ken? Well, unfortunately, many organizations change Scrum to accommodate their inadequacies or dysfunctions instead of solving them. Hmm. Now, 
I could read this and think Ken is saying don't change Scrum, but I don't think that's what Ken means. I think Ken means give Scrum a try. Now, when you get to retrospectives, you have to do serious problem solving, and then you have to solve problems. You can't just be like the three monkeys in the earlier diagram where one's not looking, one's not saying, one doesn't want to hear anyway. Hear no, see no, speak no evil. And today, we still have these problems, although I think we're making a lot of progress. So here is Scrum. Actually, this is extreme, pro this is whatever, iterating, okay? I don't use the S word, I'll tell you why in a little while. Uh, iteration, iteration, and hardening. What's this hardening thing about? You know, if you start doing Scrum and you want to uh, uh, release after several iterations, but you don't have a good automation in place, you've got to go do all your tests. And so here we are at the bottom of the waterfall. There I am. It's kind of a nice, peaceful bottom to the waterfall. And I'm down there looking around for bugs. It's kind of wet. Um, but it seems like not too bad of a place to be. Is that what it's like at the bottom of the waterfall? Or is it more like this? You know, you've used up all the time. The pressure is on. No, you don't have many options. And you just got to take your lumps. And we just got to trudge through it. Right, so we're getting crushed at the bottom of the waterfall. So what happens at the end of these iterations before you're about to release your product? See, there's some little fires popping up here in the feed. And, uh, you know, that would be great because we had the hardening sprint to find the bugs, right? Now, now, then somebody says, you know, there's just one more bug. Oh, and that's when it gets kind of interesting when somebody says there's one more bug. And then one more bug after that. And, oh, my gosh, Ooh, the fire. How does this happen? Why does it happen? Um, I know. It's somebody else's fault. Oh, wait. No, it's our fault. Oh, we, you know, we probably have to take some responsibility here for this because we did make the mess, didn't we? I know it was here before, but, okay. So here is managing bugs. This is a Bugzilla website process that I pulled about 10 years ago as an example here. Um, I don't want to be good at this. Um, now, are there any developers in the room? Can you developers do a thumbs up here? I need you all in the virtual room. I need you all to stand up. Now, if you don't want to live a life of bug hunting, you have to admit there's a problem. And the problem is you, all right? I'm a programmer and I write bugs. Everybody, okay, give a thumbs up if you're saying it right now to yourself. I'm a programmer and I write bugs. Come on, more of you. All right, I think this thumbs up thing is pretty cool. <laughs> all right, okay, there's a chance for you. Okay, all right, okay. No gnashing of your teeth anymore. Okay, let's move on. Um, so technical excellence, what is it? Getting the app to work, chasing down the bugs. Well, you got to know how to do that, but that's not technical excellence. Now, one of the biggest problems, according to Jeff Sullivan, the other one of the other Scrum founders, is that people can't get a shippable product. So one of the really cool things that's going on right now is DevOps, which as far as a guy like me that came up through extreme programming thinks looking at that is, well, yeah, that's extreme programming taken to its conclusion. You've got to automate your pipeline. And actually, there were people doing that back in 1999, uh, where they actually in a hardware software environment was a machine that uh, I wrote. A, I had a, a friend contribute a story to my book about it. It was a machine that processed potatoes and turned them into French fries. Um, you know, basically truckloads of potatoes got dumped into this machine, and it was all automated. And uh, at any rate, they had a they had a continuous build pipeline uh, back in 1999 the logical conclusion of extreme programming. Um, but, you know, so people aren't getting it done. They're doing the do cycle. They're doing, they're doing scrum. They're not solving their problems. They're worried about the deadlines. Yeah, of course, the business lives on deadlines. We've got to make deadlines. That they're important. What we want to do is have the most, po the best possible thing for the deadline, right? Not an arbitrary deadline, a meaningful deadline, 
and we'll deliver the best value we can by that point. Now, when you adopted Scrum, did engineering change how they do engineering? Incremental management and planning without incremental engineering skills is a recipe for pain. And I've, I've seen a lot of pain around this, right? We start iterating and the people that are supposed to do the delivery are not used to working iteratively. So it's painful. They feel like they're doing poor work. And so I'm going to propose an, a, a, uh, I'll propose you a marriage. I'm not the first one to propose a marriage like this, the marriage of extreme programming and Scrum. All right, so Scrum has the planning practices that have been popularized. Extreme programming has the technical practices that can make you successful at Scrum. And actually the Scrum Alliance started doing something about this a few years ago. What, 2014, there were some certified Scrum developers. Are there any certified Scrum developers in the audience? All right, well, the metrics are working out just fine here for me. Um, so here we are back in 2014. There's updated numbers. I didn't get them, but uh, it's well over a million Scrum Masters now. Uh, so 300 and some thousand Scrum Masters and 50 some thousand Scrum developers. What does this tell you? This tells you it takes six Scrum Masters to master one Scrum developer, obviously. By that ratio, what else could it mean? Now, somebody goes off to Scrum Master School. Come on, you can give me a few more thumbs up on that one. That was like one of my best jokes ever. No, okay, so maybe it wasn't. Okay, okay, you guys are kind. All right, I've heard that about. So somebody goes off to, off to Scrum Master School and comes back, inserts all these micromanagement techniques is what the developers are thinking, right? They're being micromanaged now. They don't like it. They don't understand it. They're not sure how to work in this environment. They're being asked to sprint, which means go full blast as much as you can. Oh, sprint. I'm sorry. I told you I wasn't going to use that word, but this is why I don't use it. It's a wrong metaphor. Right? Well, look at what happens to the sprinters. They gave it everything. They collapsed. And now your scrum master comes over, your product owner comes over and helps you back to your feet, gives you some oxygen so you can do it again. This is not really what we want to do. We have to find a sustainable pace, right? It's not doing anyone any good by overloading this vehicle, right? It doesn't have the capacity to take on that workload. And we're wondering why things don't end so well. So maybe we're not doing as good at bringing the agile ideas into development. Here's a typical rant. on. Uh, here's one on Quora back from about five years ago, four years ago, um, it popped up in my feed. You know, why do developers dislike Agile? And so I read this article and I um, was filled with misconceptions. So I wrote an article about, you know, how, what they got wrong. Um, but, and then my article, at the time when I took this snapshot, I got, you know, a, a few hundred upvotes and a couple hundred th or hundred thousand views, which is like, I was shocked that anybody cared about what I had to say there. Um, here's some guy, he got half a million views and 3,600 upvotes because he hates Agile. And his story is 100% true and 100% not Agile. He just doesn't know what it is. He's being iteratively managed, but he doesn't know iterative engineering. And so I was out to dinner with some people once in Chicago not too long ago, and I um, was talking to them and they were talking about their Agile. I said, yeah, people do the easy half of Agile. They don't do the hard half of Agile. And he said, well, what's the hard half of Agile? I said, the technical practices. Yeah, of course, I'm saying the technical practices. He goes, no, that's not the hard half of Agile. The hard half of Agile is the people. It's like, oh, gosh. A truer statement <laughs> had, not been, had not been said. It's like, I'm thinking there's two halves to Agile and there's three. Oh, no. Move over, iterative planning and technical excellence. We got to make room for respect for people. Okay, so respect for people. This is missing. And actually, if you're asking people to iterate and you haven't given them the skills to do it successfully, haven't helped them learn those skills, this is a recipe for disaster.
or at least a recipe for pain. So here's this debrief. I do a little debrief with the people I work with uh, whenever I'm doing a training class. Looks like we got about 10 minutes left, so I probably have to pick this up a little bit. Um, and in my training class, I ask them, how much time do they spend debugging and how much time do they spend coding? And it's kind of interesting that there's a wide range. Usually the guy that brought me in is a guy who's not having to debug so much and everybody else is spending a lot of their time debugging. And a lot of people live with really long build cycles. So if you're trying to keep your mind focused on your work and all of a sudden you got to wait five minutes to get feedback on your code, guess where your brain goes? It doesn't stay in the work. You got to restart. Um, you know, how do you test your code? I ask them. And people are using log messages and printouts and sitting around waiting for the manuals, you know, to run their manual tests and single stepping through their code and, you know, running it in the debugger, right? Every time you code, you have to use the debugger. Otherwise, how do you know it works, right? This is status quo. Um, a lot of the tools are the same tools that I used in 1979. And a lot of the techniques, the same techniques. So I'd like to congratulate all the developers using those 1979 development techniques when we've learned a lot since then, right? I wish we, I wish more people knew about it though. Debug later programming is what we learned, is what you all that are programmers learned is debug later programming. What is debug later programming? <clears throat> Your program will have bugs and they will surprise you when you find them. This is what John Gall tells us from the Systems Bible. Really good read. Highly recommend it. Uh, so here, this team is celebrating their release. Having killed 1,293 bugs, a bug comes and spoils the party, and the lead developer hacks the bug. I mean, engineers a solution to the defect. And now they're getting ready to go back to their party, and they don't even know they're surrounded, totally surrounded. Oh, no, what are we getting? They don't know. They're back into great uh, blissful ignorance. Where do these bugs come from? You know, we can't blame anybody else. We got to take responsibility. Responsibility. No, we can't blame anybody else. We have to take responsibility. Okay. Because when you do development followed by test, you're going to find defects. You're just not going to find all of them. I'm a programmer and I write bugs. Okay. We've got to have some humility here. It's not our fault. Yes, it is. <laughs> we put them there. So what is the impact of debug later programming? Now, if you're interested in getting your team started with uh, test-driven development, you have to understand what they're doing right now, debug later programming. You have to recognize it's a problem. People make mistakes. Now, they don't realize they make mistakes because the feedback cycle is so long that once a bug is discovered, oh, you know, maybe they didn't even write the bug. Somebody else did. Now they got to go find the cause and fix it and not break anything else in the process to have to cause this <laughs> process to repeat. That find time is a huge waste. What if we could do something different? As Dijkstra suggests that we should not waste our time debugging. We should not put the bugs in the first. We should not introduce the bugs to start with. Now, Dr. Dijkstra didn't tell us how to do that, though. So we've got to go, what, what could we do? And kind of like integral calculus and, and calculating the area under the curve, I think test-driven development is kind of an approximation of proving what software is doing. It shows you what it's doing. It doesn't show you what it's not doing, I suppose. But it's kind of like that. And so back to this marriage. Um, extreme programming. You all know about Scrum, okay? What about extreme programming? What's it built on? Well, you know, as an engineer, it's very appealing to me as an engineer because it's very, once you kind of have experienced it, you know it's solid problem solving. And you're cranking the knobs up to 11. And, uh, you know, if, if quality is important, we got to deal with it every day. If testing is good, we deal with it all the time. If reviews are good, we're reviewing all the time. If it's good to talk to the customer, you know, talk to the customer every day. Now, Scrum has this on their list. And if planning is important, yeah, let's keep the plan alive. Now, Scrum does this too if you're doing Scrum as it's supposed to be done. So here are these practices. I'm not going to, of course, talk about them all right now, but they are the engineering practices that make it possible for you to survive iterative development, not just survive, but to uh, uh, succeed and thrive in iterative development. 
at the core is this microcycle. It sounds so simple, so ridiculous, but it works so nicely. Write a test, watch it fail, make it pass, clean up your code. Any test-driven developers in the crowd out there? I'm seeing some hands. Good. Good. So get some more. Okay, so we want, what if we had to spend our time at the bottom of the waterfall before test-driven development? What happens to us after test-driven development? Life is more like a fast-moving stream, not without bumps, not without turbulence, but you get something to work and pretty much stays working for its useful life until you change your mind about how you want it to work. If you change something and it starts working differently than you defined how you want it, you get notified, right? The code tells you it's broken. It changes the physics of development. We make a mistake still. This is human nature. And actually test-driven development, before I started doing test-driven development, I thought I was good at programming. And then I realized, oh, no, you actually really are bad at this um, because I make mistakes and little mistakes all the time. Uh, per minute, probably measurable per minute, if I'm typing, definitely if, if I'm typing. And then that means um, my find time is the work I just did. So because I have a fast feedback cycle, I can check it, I can run my code and see that the find time is low. And now I don't have to go chase around and find those bugs that I'm going to have a hard time trying to find. Right? And the fix is usually easy. Sometimes one test a new test passes, and 15 other existing tests fail. <laughs> you just saved yourself from 15 bugs, potentially. And then that's when you start to think, hmm, there's something here because I forgot about that detail that all those things depended on that thing I just changed. Oh, yes. So it's not all the test followed by all the development. It is a feedback cycle. This is what makes it successful. People like feedback cycles, too. right? You get rewarded for your work here. Now, you know, you might think though, you've got 10 years experience, why should you learn this thing? Because you're already an experienced, you got a senior engineer position, right? Why should you learn this? And what I've kind of discovered of uh, many people, their 10 years is kind of the same year over and over again. I know my first 20 years, uh, I did see a lot of different technology, but my technique was certainly the same year over and over and over again unfortunately. Uh, but I'm an expert beginner. Um, you pass the aptitude test. Okay. Now, do you do TDD? This is kind of a rhetorical question. I saw a bunch of hands go up. Um, you know, do you create unit tests? Uh, you know, writing tests after is almost as good as test driven. I don't find it as, as good because of the influence on design, but it's almost as good. But unit tests are really critical. Um, let's see, I'm just checking my clock here. I got about five minutes left. I think we're pretty good here. So here's the testing pyramid um, that I like to use as a metaphor. It's not my invention. I think first place I saw it was Mike Cones. And uh, unit tests at the bottom provide you a solid foundation of working, of software that does what the programmer thinks it's supposed to do. Now, that's different than working code. You don't know if it works. You just know it's doing what the programmer thinks it's supposed to do, all right? So the middle of the pyramid is about tying those things together and getting them to co collaborate and produce uh, behaviors, features, right? And the top of the pyramid is interacting with the system through the way that the user is going to interact with it. Now, unit tests tell you the code does what the programmer thinks. The tests in the middle tell you the code does what the customer wants. Hmm. Why don't we just do, considering we don't have much time, why don't we just do the tests in the middle of the pyramid and not do those ones about the programmer? Well, let's go see if that's a good idea. Imagine a simple system with three components, each with 10 states or 10, complexity 10, and you decided to test them together as a subsystem. How many test cases do you need? Now, if you can make a thousand thumbs up go up right now, that's the right number, 10 times 10 times 10. A thousand tests, forget it, it's not worth it. Okay. But if you're doing unit tests and you wanted to thoroughly test each piece, how many unit tests are needed? And now what we have are 30 tests, okay, 30 tests. Now that's, and we need some integration tests, okay, but you gotta go to Nayesh's, uh, I, sorry for not pronouncing your name right, 
Nayesh's um, session, his talk today, on what to do about the integration. Okay, I'm talking about the unit, so he's going to solve that other problem. All right, so this is that. Now, you do need to make sure everything hooks together properly, and here's an example of this code compiles and links, but uh, I think there's a couple of use cases <laughs> that aren't uh, covered in the tests. Pretty sure about that. Um, now, manual test is prevalent in our industry. And um, as a motivation to start to automate, let's just look at, you know, how companies are typically structured and kind of what that means. So here is a, a typical organization working in iterations. And you have so many development engineers and so many test engineers. Implicit in that is that the effort to develop something, let me say that again, implicit to this relationship here is that the effort to develop something is proportional to the effort to test it. Because you could count how many developers there are and count how many testers there are, there's an implicit assumption there. Now, the systems Bible suggests that if a system is working, leave it alone, don't change anything. And guess what that means to all of us? We don't have a job anymore, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna ignore that. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, do you have anything else for us? And John's got a lot more for us. He goes, well, realize that systems don't appreciate being fiddled and diddled with. Now, I don't know if those terms translate very well because you learned probably better English than I did. Um, fiddled, you know, well, messing around with changing the system is what it has to deal with. Kind of a um, funny way of saying it. Okay. And the subtitle of, of John's book is the study of systematics, which looks like a very serious academic word, but actually is pretty funny. Um, it stands for system antics. Systems act up. All right. Systems act up. A system, right, something that that is there for a goal and antics, frivolous, eccentric activity. All right, let's just look at an example. And here's an example, a family system. And of course, you've tried to tame this system and take a family photo. And of course, the photo is in failure mode. Uh, the, the crowd is in failure mode every time. I don't have serious pictures of any of these people, I don't think. Um, but because systems act up, we have to be careful. Right, so what does that mean? We have to be careful. That means that after the second iteration, we must retest the first iteration. After the third iteration, we must retest the first two. After the fourth iteration, et cetera, et cetera. And what does that mean? We've got this unsustainable growth of effort that's needed, and we don't have the effort to put into it. So we're accumulating risk. And then one day, lightning strikes at the wrong time, and guess what happens? Boom, there's those flames again, all right? What we want to do with test-driven development and test automation is start to flatten the curve. Oh, flatten the curve, ha, how timely. I even have my own little large-size coronavirus here for the occasion. But uh, all right, so it looks like I'm out of time, and this is probably a pretty good time to stop. I do have, sometimes if I talk slower, well, or faster, I might have gone further. Um, what I'm hoping your takeaway here is, oh yeah, quality code matters. The lawyers are coming, all right? There's blood in the water. And us development people, if we don't want to be led around by our nose, we better get our act in order. All right, I know you're different because you do embedded systems or whatever the thing that makes you different. You think that this isn't for you because you're special. Yeah, you are special. It just doesn't matter. This stuff will help you. All right, so repeat after me again. I'm a programmer and I write bugs and I invite you to stay in touch with me and to don't think about the shortcuts, think about the habits. Kent Beck told me something 20 years ago. He goes, I'm not that good of a developer, but I've developed good habits. And this is, I think, kind of a key idea and excellence is about developing good habits. Here's a little bit about how to stay in touch with me. And I understand we're gonna go off to the lounge and Chat, I'll, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all the thumbs up. That was really a nice way to get feedback. And uh, 
have a good rest of your day. All right. Thanks a lot, James, uh, for reiterating the importance of technical excellence. And uh, I mean, I, I, I loved all your jokes. Uh, <laughs> really timely, awesome. Uh, let's see if we have uh, questions for you uh, here from the audience. Okay. Uh, so I see a question by uh, Jeevan. Uh, Jeevan's asking, uh, convincing developers and management in taking up TDD is a separate uh, way and challenging. Uh, from your experience, what are the best ways to convince them to achieve this uh, apart from uh, numbers? So other than showing numbers, what are other techniques you've used to convince people and management to embrace TDD? So one of the things that's kind of lost from the beginning of uh, Agile, Extreme Programming and Agile, 20 years ago, is why are we doing any of this stuff? And the reason we're doing any of this stuff is because there are serious problems we want to solve. So if your problem that you want to solve is delivering defects to your customer, are you willing to actually change how you work for that? If those defects are causing you to be late, are you willing to change how you work to try to do that? Okay, well, I'll at least listen to you about what this TD thing is, how it's supposed to do. It's a pretty short logic chain. I gave you several of the argument, several of the models here, like debug later programming versus test-driven development. That's one model. I've got a blog article about that. And then the uh, sustainable manual test is unsustainable, the flames at the end, right? Why do we have to automate? Because you can't retest everything manually. And so these are a couple of motivating things. If you don't experience those problems, you're not going to want to do it. But if you are experiencing those problems, the logic chain, you do the logic chain, and then you have to get people to do it and to try it, okay? Um, in my training class, I start out by saying, hmm, do you people like writing bugs? Do you write bugs? Yes, they all agree they write bugs. Uh, would you like to let, write less of them? Sure, yeah, that's a good idea. Here's how we're going to do it. And they go, really? That's going to work? And I have them do it, and they go, that's never going to work. And I have them do it for two more days. And then they're starting to think, huh, I think that's going to work. So I don't know. That's my method. But it takes a lot of time. It's a skill to grow. So thank you for that question. All right. Uh, we have one more question here. And I'd encourage you to please put it in the Q&A section. Uh, there is a question from Radhika. In a DevOps uh, situation or scene, uh, do you suggest to separate the testers and the developers? Uh, a friend of mine keeps attributing this statement to me um, uh, that I might have made at a conference once as an underhanded remark. And the statement was, talk to each other, people. Okay, so I'm, I'm quoting Marcelo, who quotes me, saying that I said, talk to each other. So, uh, you know, are there different skill sets there? Are there different focuses? Should they be separate? What does that mean? Should they work together? I think it's pretty clear they should work together. Um, the handoffs are very expensive. Uh, so working together would be, I think, very important. Um, now, different skills, uh, you know, so, you know, there's probably a lot of different ways to answer that question. Um, some people criticize the idea of test-driven development because it's a developer writing their own tests. That's different than the tests at the middle of the pyramid where you're going to involve more of the company, right? So I kind of like to ask, whose responsibility is it to make sure my code does what I think it's supposed to do? <laughs> Me. Whose responsibility is it the product works? Right? That's all of us. Right? So you better talk to each other if you want to be successful at that. All right. Great. I think those were the two questions that uh, pretty much came up. Uh, if, if you don't mind, James, I'll, I'll throw in one quick question from my side. Sure. Uh, so uh, it's been a few years now that I've uh, I've been making the statement that code is liability; it's not an asset. Uh, okay. The value of code does not increase over a period of time, <laughs> and the little code you have, the better off you are. Uh, what I would love to hear: What's your take on that? <laughs> I've got some big code in my website. I'd like to be smaller, so. <laughs> In some of the places where I, before I knew how to test drive in a Ruby on Rails environment, if any of you know how to test drive in a Ruby on Rails environment, I'm actually looking for help for integration testing. But uh, um, so uh, that sounds 
Well, I know code does something, so it's useful. It does something useful. I know code becomes a drag because, right, we build too much of it and we don't understand it. Uh, so I can understand that liability. I know right now I'm a little bit afraid uh, when I start deploying my the self-paced training that I'm working on that my IT systems might break. Um, so uh, I think it's an interesting insight. Uh, of course, any good life involves a balance of uh, assets and debt, right? So uh, maybe not. Maybe you don't have to have any, but uh, assets and liabilities. So I mean, every business has both. So I'm going to have to try to square that circle because we need software, obviously, and it provides great value. But then uh, the wrong software can also hurt. So I probably need to understand your premise a little bit more, too.